Welcome to OPCC and Happy New Year. Glad you all ventured out to a service this morning. Welcome to those of you joining online. Um, it may be traveling, and if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 20. As we unpack the most debated chapter of the Bible, <laughs> that's not good. I am not going to solve everything today, okay? So don't expect that. I'm going to preach from it, teach you some things. Um, there are different views based on how you interpret the book of Revelation. And they're all orthodox, okay? So that's what's kind of cool about the book of Revelation. There are a lot of things in the Bible that, man, it's essential. It's essential that, hey, if you're going to be an orthodox church, you believe, <clears throat> you believe like, this is basic Christianity, but when it comes to Revelation throughout the history of the church, there have been different ways to interpret it. And all of them, like none of them you would say, well, people who believe that way, they're, they're outside of what basic, like what Christianity is, um, or they're unorthodox, if you will. And so there are, there are people that, when a, when a person comes at Revelation and they get really dogmatic about it, and they say, no, this is the way it is, and you're wrong if you believe anything else, that's probably a very unwise position to take. Um, and I really appreciate many of the scholars that I've been uh, studying as I've been trying to get a better understanding of the book of Revel Revelation as I um, you know, sit with the Lord and meditate on it myself, uh, that you know, I really appreciate that people there's value in, in being able to admit, man, there are some things God... He just hasn't given us complete clarity on it. Now, what is really cool is that regardless of how you interpret the book, there are basic things that are just true in, in every um, way that, it, like all the different ways to interpret the book of Revelation, whether premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial, uh, or if you kind of borrow from all of them, which is a little bit of what I do, they all have agreement on the major doctrines of what Revelation is teaching. And so the essential piece is not how we interpret it, but how we live, how we live according to what it teaches. And so I'm going to preach through it, and I'll make some observations along the way. Um, and then I'm going to share some takeaways that I believe are essential, regardless of the interpretation you make. And then we'll go and grab us a bite to eat and watch the Chiefs play. Amen? It's too cold to do anything else. And hunting season's closed or we go hunting. Right? Yeah, yeah, man. All right, good. Let's start in chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be set free for a short time. And I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead... Did not, come, <clears throat> did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to, the gather, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. The fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown." 
They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And so what we have here is um, what is described as the millennium. Um, And again, there are different ways that you can approach it. And so for a premillennialist, they believe that... um, the way you would inter- make interpretations on, on the book of Revelation is that we're kind of progressing toward things getting really, really bad. And at some point uh, in the future, Jesus will rapture the church out. Could be before what is known as uh, the Great Tribulation, which is a seven-year period according to this school of thought. And could be before, could be in the middle, could be after. But Jesus will rapture the church out. Um, and things will get really bad, <clears throat> and then he will make a judgment uh, on the world. There will be what is known as a battle, where the false prophet and um, the, the beast are judged, and then ultimately the dragon, who is Satan himself, who is behind all of it, is judged. And Jesus, at one point, will have um, the devil bound, and he will put him in the abyss, for a literal thousand-year period. And during this thousand-year period, Jesus will reign as an earthly Messiah in Jerusalem. And all the believers that are raptured, they will be in a resurrected form, like Jesus. And everybody who makes it through the tribulation, are known as the tribulation saints, will go into that thousand-year period. Because it is such a time of Uh, peace and prosperity, and it is led by Jesus. People will live longer lives. Many of the earth's population will have um, perished during all of the plagues that have happened up to this point in the book of Revelation, and there will be a need for a repopulation of the earth, and people will live very long lives during this thousand-year period under the reign of Christ. And then, at the end of the reign of Christ, um, the devil will be let out of the abyss where he has been bound, and he will um, wreak havoc, and there will be another attempt to overthrow Christ and his kingdom. And all of the people that were living during the millennium, many will say they follow Jesus, but they don't actually follow Jesus. And when the devil is let out of the abyss... It will prove who actually does belong to the Lord and who does not, that many will rebel against the rule of Christ and follow um, all that is evil. And then immediately Christ will cast judgment on evil. It'll be thrown into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the beast already exist. And then we'll get, uh, you know, after that, ju- after that judgment of all the world, the dead, Um, will be raised. And so all those who died throughout time will be raised at this point, and they will be judged at the great white throne judgment. And then you have, which we'll learn in the the coming weeks, you have a new heaven and a new earth. So that's kind of premillennialism in a nutshell. All right, a lot of different things go on. Amillennialism believes that the first judgment, and, and they interpret sort of... You come at this as apocalyptic literature, it's loaded with symbology, right? And when you study the Old Testament minor prophets, there's a lot of apocalyptic literature and many of the minor prophets found at the end of the Old Testament. And a lot of times, and I learned this as, we, as I preached through them back at the beginning, I think, in 2020, 
It took me quite a while to preach through all the minor prophets. But in the minor prophets, what you have is a prophet would, he would prophesy something, maybe in chapter 1 or 2. Then in chapter 3, the prophecy would be repeated, but it would be explained in a greater detail. And then sometimes they would do it even again, and more detail would be given. And so um, I see that pattern a lot in the book of Revelation. I hear, like, we already seen where, like the, like, the war of Armageddon, and now we have this war again. So a lot of times an amillennialist or a figurative per, person who comes at it figuratively would look and say, this is just a repetition of the same battle that we studied um, previously. And so they would view this as Satan is already bound, and we are already living in the millennial uh, reign of Christ, and it is a spiritual kingdom. And so when Jesus was crucified on the cross of Calvary, and he rose from the dead, then at that moment, Satan was bound, and he had already been kicked out of heaven. We saw that in chapter 12. He no longer can accuse the brethren, and now he is bound, but he's allowed to still wreak some havoc. <clears throat> and so the thousand-year reign of Christ is a spiritual kingdom known as the church age. And so it would be us. We're living right now, uh, according to an all-millennial view or a figurative view, we're living in <clears throat> the millennial time or the millennial reign of Christ, and the, and the Lord reigns in the hearts of his people. And ultimately, at a time known only to himself, he will return to the planet. And when he returns to the planet, all of the dead will be raised and judgment will take place. And the, all, everything that is evil will be cast into the lake of fire. And Christ will create a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and the old heaven and the old earth will pass away, and we will be ushered into eternity. And so that's kind of like uh, the millennial view in a nutshell. The post-millennial view is not as popular as it once was, because it, it sort of is really similar um, to premillennialism, except for it believes that things will continue to get better and better and better as the gospel spreads, and Christ begins to reign in the hearts of people until ultimately we end up with a Christian utopia where Christ returns, and it's the golden age of the church. And that, that view, man, was really popular whenever we went through the Industrial Revolution and, and, and all of the things where things were becoming modern and medicine was growing and, and all of the, the uh, um, scientific discoveries. And man, people were like, man, it is. It's getting better. It's getting better. It's getting better. And then World War I happened and messed all that up, right? And then World War II. Uh, and so people kind of got out of that camp because it was apparent that even though things were advancing from a technological standpoint and scientific standpoint, the heart of man was still uh, desperately uh, wicked and corrupt. And so we, we look at that, and there it is for what it's worth. Now you can go on and I could talk for days about all these different views, but that's not what the Lord has asked me to do. Um, this is not a theology class. This is a sermon to help you understand, man, what do I do with this? I mean, I come at chapter 20, and I read this, and like, what, what are the essential things that I need to take away, especially as I go into this new year, 2020, 2022, and uh, the Lord calls me to obedience. And here's, here's what the Lord has shared with me out of this text. First of all, you need to understand you are raised to reign with Christ. That's the first thing you got to know, is that the whole basis of salvation, he says that they are made, um, they are, we are raised in, in that chapter 20, it says they become, in verse um, 6, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and will reign with him for a thousand years. And so we know that the Bible teaches that when we are saved, that we become, that, that we experience what is known as the priesthood of the believer. So I don't need a priest that I pray through anymore. Jesus is my high priest, and he makes me into one of his priests. And so I can speak directly to God through my relationship with Christ. And so the Lord 
um, has saved us, the whole basis of salvation is to reign as a citizen in the city of God. Whether you believe it, that we are living in the millennial reign or you believe that the millennial reign of Christ is out in the future, it doesn't matter. Spiritually, I believe that's teaching that the first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection. And I have been raised to life in Christ. And so now I serve as a priest of God, not because I'm a pastor, but because I know Jesus. And you serve as a priest of God if you know Jesus. You serve as a prophet of God if you know Jesus, because Jesus is in you. You have the authority of Jesus, because Jesus is a king. And so Jesus wraps up the three offices of the Old Testament in prophet, priest, and king, When we are forgiven of our sins, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and now the prophet, priest, and king lives inside of us, and we serve in a prophetic and a priestly and a kingly role as citizens of the city of God walking through the planet on a daily basis. It's kind of what Sean was talking about in our worship, man. We ought to be people who are testifying about the joy of the Lord simply by the fact that it doesn't matter how bad things get around us, whether it's uh, 2020 when the pandemic broke out or 2021 when the economy was terrible or 2022 when we don't know what holds. One thing we do know, if you know Jesus, you have a prophetic, priestly, and kingly role, and that ought to create some joy for you. It's like, what What in the world, man? Like, I can look at myself and go, man, I have a prophetic role to serve as a citizen in the city of God. I have the authority in a, 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 of king that he has given to me to walk out the obedience that he's called me to, and I serve as a priest that makes daily sacrifices to him with my life. And so the Lord has made us priests to rule and reign. We are raised, first of all, this, get, you got to get this. We are raised to newness of life and are to rule and reign ourselves. The Bible says that um, in the book of Proverbs that if you do not have rule over your own spirit, you're like a city without walls. And walls in an ancient city, um, is, that was the whole protection of the city. That the enemy couldn't invade the city without accessing through the gates. They couldn't go over the walls. They would get maybe shot with arrows or big stones dropped on them, whatever you uh, want to think. And so a a person who doesn't have rule over their own um, souls, their own spirits, is like a city without walls. And so it's important for us to understand when it says, when I say that you're raised to reign with Christ, the first thing that you need to be concerned about reigning is yourself not the people around you. Because until you can reign over yourself and Christ has lordship in your life, you have no business trying to lead anyone else. But once you learn how to rule your own spirit and you know how to um, die to yourself so that Christ might live in you, you're understanding the first resurrection and spiritually you're alive in Christ and the new life is manifesting itself. You will find yourself by default in a leadership position because other new believers will gravitate to you and they will want to learn from you as you have established spiritual life and maturity in your own walk. And this is the process of uh, of discipleship. It's just how discipleship works. We, we spend time with one another. We learn from one another. We teach each other. And so that's what happens when you learn to reign yourself. And so regardless of your view of the millennium, we know that evil was bound at Calvary, that Christ was victorious over evil. And since evil is bound and ultimately will be destroyed... We shouldn't be letting it loose, okay? We should be keeping it bound. One time Jesus comes to his disciples. This is taught in Matthew chapter 16. He says, hey, bros, who, who, who do you say that I am? He says, well, some say you're, John, you know, you're Elijah. Some say you're um, a prophet. And he says, yeah, but who do you think I am? And Peter steps up to the plate and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, that's right, bro. And this wasn't revealed to you. Uh, he didn't say bro, by the way. I can't paraphrase it. He says, that's right. He says, and this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood, but this was revealed to you from my Father in heaven. And he says, upon this rock, 
that I am the Christ. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So we have, again, the idea of binding and loosing. And so to reign with Christ is to keep evil bound and let heaven loose in your life. That's what it means to reign with Christ. How can I... How can I lock evil up and keep it bound for me and find out ways to unlock where heaven is getting loose in my life? And the more I bind up evil and let heaven loose, the greater the reign I have as a priest of God on this side of eternity. And so to reign with Christ, again, is to keep heaven bound, to let heaven loose, because we have been raised, the second death has no power over us. The first death we will experience, but... The second death we will not experience, which the second death is whenever people are placed into the lake of fire. So if you have died to yourself, I love what C.S. Lewis says, "Die die die before you die because there are no chances after that. You've got to learn to die to yourself on this side of eternity before you pass away physically. If you don't learn how to die to yourself so that Christ can be raised up in you, spiritually you're resurrected, then your fate is forever sealed. You will go to Hades or Sheol, okay? Which, what in the world is Hades or Sheol? Because it says the dead in Christ, and I'll get into that here in a minute, right? Well, I almost got into it right now. I need to hold on. But I got ahead of myself, bro. Right? And so like you, you are, if you die in that state without receiving Christ prior, you are forever locked in that state. And that's what this judgment will be about in the future. But if you do die to yourself so that Christ might be raised in you, then the second death has no power over us. And the result is that when we realize that, we become fearless and bold to reign in this life and the here and now, and, to, and we are already becoming familiar with what we will be then and there, which will last throughout eternity. And that, that fearlessness and that boldness to believe what Jesus has done in my life is the, also the same thing that, um, that uh, knowing that the second death has no power over me is the same thing that creates joy in my life. It is the strength that enables me to walk through this life and whatever things that I may face, whatever experiences lie ahead of me in 2022, I don't need to be anxious about because the second death has no power over me. I am fearless and bold. And even if 2022 has a report for me that I'm going to get a terminal illness and I might not make it to 2023, it's okay. Why is it okay? Because the second death has no power over me. I am, I am raised to life in Christ, okay? So you are raised to reign with Christ. That makes you fearless and bold to reign with him. Here's the second takeaway. I'm going to bless y'all today, okay? I'm going to finish. What I mean is I'm going to finish before 11, all right? It's the only time this year. Here's the second thing. Before evil is destroyed a powerful delusion will permeate the world. Okay? And this delusion will start like with the beast and the false prophet that we saw was um, already cast into the lake of fire. The Bible in the New Testament um, specifically mentions this through the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. Peter talks about it in his epistle to the church, and Paul talks about it as he's writing to Timothy, and he talks about in the latter days, man, people will want to hear um, messages that are easy. They will want to be taught with things because their ears will itch and tingle, and they will just want to be satisfied. They won't bear up to sound doctrine. But you, as a young pastor, Timothy, make sure you're teaching the Word. You're instructing men. You're instructing women how to live their lives and how to lay down their lives for Christ. And so um, the, the apostles call us Uh, to do that as the Lord used them to to give the word. But this delusion will be brought on, and evil, evil, this is why we got to be careful about, like, signs and wonders. We have to know that the signs and wonders are from the Lord. Because signs and wonders will be used even to deceive, if it were possible, Jesus said, even the very elect. 
And so we, we're, not a, 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 we're not citizens who are seeking signs because we know that the sign was already given in the resurrection of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And as we walk in the priestly, prophetic, and authority of the king himself, we learn how to lay down our lives And then Christ, because we've learned to lose our lives, we find our lives, and we walk in victory on this side uh, of eternity as these citizens who function in these priestly and uh, prophetic and kingly roles. But the world ultimately continues to move toward a powerful delusion that will permeate the entire world. Okay, and the and it, and the world itself is heading toward this cataclysmic conclusion, and and here's what's strange is that though we seem, and I as I say we right now, I mean as a people, a humanity, we seem so divided right now. The world, from a humanistic standpoint, will unite, but it will unite around evil. And people will embrace it. And and they will engage in that evil. But the people of God, the people who are citizens of the kingdom, who have been raised and are reigning over their spirits, will not be deceived by the delusion as it takes place. This is why sometimes you look at people and you go, well, man, I don't understand how a person can make these decisions and live this way and do these things in their lives. I don't, I don't feel like I can do that. They are drunk on the wine of Babylon that the harlot who is riding the scarlet beast, remember all that symbology, they're drunk on that wine and you have been sobered up in the spirit because you've been raised to life. And so it is going to be confusing. You won't understand how a person is able to live that way and make those decisions. And you have to be reminded by the fact that it is the grace of God that has put you in the position that you're in. And that person still hasn't been set free from their sin. And they are deluded by deception. And they are, they are living a life of, a, of, the, uh, of a lie. Okay? And so that, again, is further cause of joy to be welling up inside of your soul because you know it is only by the grace of God that you stand in the position that you stand in, not in your own self-righteousness. Now, if the world is heading toward this, and so we see this, we can see it today in our day and age, we can see clearly that evil exists and that people, and that we can see that the church exists, we're here today, right? There's some proof that Jesus rose from the dead. Listen, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I'm not here today. I'm sleeping in. Right? Why would I come to talk to people on a Sunday morning when football is going to be on all day if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? I'd be a fool. But he did. And that's why I'm here. All right? So we look around and we see the church and we go, Okay, why is the church even here? Because Jesus rose from the dead. We are citizens of the city of God, and during the midst of this powerful delusion that will only continue to increase, Jesus allows us to reign with him because we are saved to serve. Now, why is it essential to keep evil bound and let heaven loose? Because it is a witness. Every time I bind up evil in my life, And every time heaven is let loose in my life, meaning the truths of God are impacting my life and I'm following out the principles of Scripture and freedom is rolling out of my life and I'm working um, out my salvation by trying to bind up evil in my life, every time that happens, it serves as a testimony of Jesus. And what does the book of Revelation say? We'll see this, I think, in the next chapter if we didn't cover it already. Maybe it was in chapter 19. Is that this... um, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so as I walk out my obedience to Christ and I keep evil bound and I let heaven loose, it is a testimony of Jesus that is the spirit of prophecy, which prophecy is the word of God, the prophetic word of God coming to a world that is deluded by evil, trying to rescue the perishing and care for the dying. 
So that before they face the second death, they too can experience the first resurrection so the second death has no power over them. And I'm to rule and I'm to reign in myself in order that Christ may be testified about my life. We point people to the truth by binding evil and letting heaven loose. Every time I do that, I'm pointing a person to Jesus. I don't necessarily have to be doing what I'm doing right now. I'm preaching a sermon. So to bind evil and let heaven loose doesn't mean that you're going door to door witnessing. It might mean that if the Lord calls you to do that, but the Lord is never going to call you to go to door to door or to share the gospel if you don't know how the gospel can rule in your own life. Like the first thing the gospel's got to do is touch your life, and the good news has got to reign and rule in you, and then it will make its way out as heaven is let loose in your life, and you will find yourself in conversations where a person is still captivated by the delusion that the world is ultimately heading toward until Christ comes back, and you will be a testimony to Christ, and people will be, um, they will be uh, sobered up from the powerful drink of Babylon that the harlot again on the scarlet beast is serving up the world and you're rescuing people out of that. That's what the, that's what the world is all about, man. Okay? And so we made the world all about where am I going to do the rest of my life? Where am I going to live? When am I going to have kids? Who am I going to work for? Can I get this promotion? In the grand scheme of things, all of that is meaningless. All of that's just tools for you as a citizen in the city of God. And if you, have a, if you don't have an improper worldview about what Christianity is, then you will be consumed about all these things, and they are just, they are just tools of delusion if you don't put truth over the top of them. And understand that job is just to give you some provision so that you can reign over your spirit and not be worried about the food that you need to eat. And you could be a priest of God who's serving in a prophetic and kingly way while the world is being deluded. You are a testimony to Christ. And that's what all of your life is about. Your parenting is not about, well, what can I do to give my kids the greatest experience? My job as a parent to these children is to raise up the five of the best warriors I can for the Lord Jesus Christ to point them to Jesus. And whatever they do, it doesn't make any difference. And Joel is like, I'm glad of that one, right? It doesn't. Like what, but my greatest concern as a successful parent is that my kids know who the Lord is. They know how to follow him. They know how to hear his voice. They know how to walk out that obedience. And if they're doing that, then they are going to serve as a testimony to Christ as the world is being deluded. And so, so that's what we do, is we point people to truth by binding evil and letting heaven loose. The surrendered life is urgently called for, because here's the third takeaway. All are resurrected and judged. We often think of resurrection in positive terms. And it's good news. If I die today, one of the reasons I can have joy is because Christianity, the Word teaches me that today I will be with the Lord in paradise. Remember, He told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And then the Scripture teaches us that ultimately Jesus will return to the planet and my body will be raised. And my my body is raised from what has existed in paradise with Jesus, my body physically will be raised and my soul will reunite with my body and I will have a physical being just like you see right now. It will just be a glorified body. Jesus, when he rose from the dead for a period of 40 days, he appeared to many people in Jerusalem. On one occasion, the gospel writers testify that Jesus came to them. They thought he was a ghost. And he said, what do you got to eat there, bro? I'll take a piece of that fish. And he ate. Spiritual bodies don't eat. Physical bodies eat. On another occasion, he met, uh, Peter and the guys were out fishing. He was cooking on the shore breakfast, and he says to them, Come, take some of what you've caught and put it with mine. And they ate. Again, Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. And so all are resurrected and judged. And so I can look forward to that because I know that ultimately, if I die today, I go to be with the Lord in paradise 
when Jesus returns and final judgment happens, I am reunited with my physical body to live forever and ever. The apocalypse, which is what revelation is, the word revelation is the word apocalypse, it is good news if you don't experience the second death. But it is bad news if you do experience the second death. So if you don't experience the first resurrection, when you are resurrected um, with all of the rest of humanity, you will experience the second death. All the dead are resurrected physically, not just believers. This is why the, the, the word says, and the sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead. Like, everywhere there was a dead body, it gave up its dead. And why does it use the sea? Because a lot of times when people are lost at sea, they didn't know where their bodies were. They didn't know what happened to them. A lot of people died in the World Trade Center. We don't know where their bodies are. They perished. They burned up. were incinerated. It's, the same would be the sea gives up her dead. Anybody whose body has perished and has been lost and we don't know where it is, it will be regathered and the Lord miraculously will raise that body to life. All the dead are resurrected physically. Some are raised to life. The rest are raised to experience the second death. What is the second death? The second death is whenever we stand before the great white throne judgment. Believers will not stand before the throne, the great white throne judgment. Why? Because they've already been judged by God. They've already experienced the, the first resurrection. They're alive in Christ spiritually. But everybody else will stand before the judgment seat of God, the great white throne judgment. And they will be judged based on, according to what the scripture teaches us, the books. The books were open. The books that led um, to the deeds of men. This is a really important passage of Scripture. It says that then I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. What is this thing? It's saying that God in his sovereignty knows everything any person, any time, anywhere ever did. He also knows every person, any time, anywhere, what they did when they were when it was shared with them the good news of the gospel that God has given himself to save humanity. And so it begs the question, what is the basis of judgment? And that's the big idea of today's talk. Unbelievers are judged by their works, while believers are judged by the work of Jesus. Like, like that's it. That's it, man. Like, no more. No more. Do, if you get tripped up in thinking you're going to be judged at the great, like when, when Christ, at the final consummation of the age, and that your judgment is based upon your goodness, or even as a believer, you start trying to please God to be good in order to earn his acceptance, you are screwed up theologically. Like, it's not how it works. It's not how it works. You do not try to please God and perform for him like a circus monkey. You either know Jesus and you are covered by the blood, or you don't know him and you are not covered. This is why this is important. It's because once you get this, and once you understand who you are and to whom you belong to, you will start to live right. If you try to live right to earn God's favor, you will be deluded over and over and you will fail miserably. But if you start to understand that the work of Christ on the cross atoned for your sins, he propitiated everything that was supposed to be on you, God the Father 
propitiated, this is a theological term, the King James Bible uses it, he propitiated it onto the Son, he took it off of you and put it onto the Son. You start to see that and you start to get overwhelmed by the love of God. And that makes you love people. Trying to love people because you know that that's what a believer is supposed to do doesn't make you love people. It might make you love them for a day or so, but it ain't long before you mess up. When you realize <laughs> when you realize the love of God, the longer you're alive, the more evil you will recognize in your life. The longer you surrender to Jesus, you'll think, man, I'm I've been serving the Lord here now for 30 years and preaching and pastoring. And I know, I know I'm a better human being for the sake of Jesus has more rule in my life. But when I compare myself to Jesus, man, like, I can't bat a thousand. <laughs> And what's so comforting to me is he, he doesn't ask me to. What he asks me to do is believe, is to sit with him. And what he does is he convicts me in the midst of my walk with him, and he shows me where I'm erring. And so, like, if you're trying to attain to this place of perfection in order to get it, you're never getting there. The, and the longer you work at it and the harder you try, the more miserable you're going to become because you have to come to a place that it is the perfection of Christ that makes you right. And now all of a sudden, you recognize that if I'm trying to be perfect, I'm trying to do something that only God could do. And if I'm trying to be perfect, I will start living in self-righteousness, which is exactly what the Pharisees were condemned for. He says, you guys are so full of yourselves, and you can't do it. And, and so you'll start living in this place of pride that I can do these things, and well, at least I'm not like this person. Look how bad they are. And then you become self-righteous, and you think that you're doing pretty good, and the rest of the world is evil, when really all the Lord is asking you to do is to recognize that everyone is desperately wicked and falls short of the glory of God. But those whom I've done a work in, I've placed over there, and I've consecrated for them, my, them for myself. And as they yield to me, I let heaven roll out of their lives more and more. And the more I let heaven roll out of their lives, the more heaven is loosed in their lives, the more they look like me. Not because they're trying to look like me, but because they know they look like me. You see, you have to know what you are before you will ever be what you be. That's not good English, but you know what I'm saying. You have to know before you can be. Don't try to be before you know and just dwell on this thought. Dwell, dwell on this thought over and over. I'm a priest of God. Like I, I have kingly authority. I'm to serve as a prophet. And you will start to recognize that you're starting to live different. And instead of trying to live different, you'll just live different. And, and again, I, I hope I'm being clear on that. This is it. If you are in Christ, you are in the book of life and you are covered. If you are not in Christ, <laughs> then you will be judged on the basis of your righteousness, which will fall short of the glory of God. If you are in Christ, man, it's the righteousness of Christ. You get a, the big idea is like, man, am I in Christ or not in Christ? And how do I get in Christ? You know, lay down your life and sacrifice it on the altar and say, Lord, here it is. And when you do that, man, you're dying, to, you're dying before you die so that Christ might live in you. And then your life on a daily basis is to become a living sacrifice. But again, let me tell you, like the secret is to not focus on your sacrifice that you're going to make today. The secret is to focus on the sacrifice that Jesus made. And then it starts getting easy for you to lay stuff down. You're like, well, if Jesus did that, I can do this. 
If, if Jesus did that, I can, I can give this up. And you're just constantly thinking about what Jesus sacrificed. And then it starts helping you lay down the things in your life that you need to lay down. Be encouraged in the Lord today if you know him. And if you don't know him, like maybe today is the day you lay your life down. And so we're going to take communion. We're going to end the service. And uh, I almost made it by 11. Close enough. But, but as we go into this communion time, like he, he, every, the word teaches us to do this. What does Jesus say? He gives us this, like he institutes the Lord's Supper. He says, take this as my body, eat it. And so we eat it and it's crushed. It was broken for, him, for us. Take, drink, this is my blood. And what is he saying? Remember this. He says, as often as you do this, remember, remember the sacrifice. Remember the sacrifice. Remember the sacrifice. Don't think about your sacrifice. Think about his sacrifice, and your sacrifices will become easier in 2022. So let's bow in a spirit of prayer. Sean will lead us in worship. We'll take communion, and we'll be on our way. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you today for your word. Lord, Forgive us for complicating things that are so simple. Help us, Lord, to remember your sacrifice more and more. Help us to meditate on it so that the sacrifices that would testify of you, that would let heaven loose in our lives and bind up evil, they become natural for us because we're constantly thinking about you. And so, Lord, even as we take communion today, we pray that as 2022 unfolds, that would be our main goal, Lord, is remembering your sacrifice and letting you reign in our lives. We love you. We thank you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.